Uh, hello, I'm Eric Lee, President of the Asian Institute of International Law. Today we have the honor to interview with Professor Sulia Subedi at the University of Leeds in the, in the United Kingdom. As one of the most highly known international lawyers of our time, Professor Subedi studied law at the Trifurva University in Nepal, at the University of Hull and Oxford, where he got his LLM and doctoral degree. In addition to teaching international law at the University of Leeds, he has been working for many international public services, including the UN Special Report for Human Rights in Cambodia. Professor Betty is a prolific writer, publishing many books and articles with various topics of international law. Hey, good evening, sir. Thank you for coming here. How about your first impression of Korea? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to share some of my thoughts with you. Yeah, our pleasure, right. Uh, I arrived yesterday, and so far I'm having a very pleasant time. Mm -hmm. This is to a very peaceful, very pleasant, and very organized city. Right, okay. This is your, your uh, location is very central Seoul, right, central Korea, right. So, yeah. Okay, back into Korea, Korea again. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Wait, let's get started our interview with some personal questions. You're mm -hmm. some from Nepal, yeah. the land of holy mountains and lofty streets. Yeah. So would you briefly introduce your people and your family? And how did this circumstance influence your uh, life or your ambition? Thank you. Well, my country is the, uh, is the country of uh, the birthplace of Lord Buddha mm -hmm. and lots of Himalaya mountains. Right, it's okay. a picturesque and a beautiful country. Right, okay. And uh, I come from a small family, mm -hmm. uh, it's a Brahmin family mm -hmm. in the western side of the country. And my father himself was a scholar of Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. So education was part of our culture, Your culture right. in my blood. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment, education and then service to other people. Mm -hmm. Not only looking after yourself, but looking after the society, mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. That's what the culture we were brought up with. Mm -hmm. So when I began to study, my father was, the, the work he was doing was very encouraging and inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. So from quite early on, I had this idea to serve the nation. Mm -hmm. Then I thought law would be the best discipline. And then I decided to join the university in Kathmandu, the main university, mm -hmm. the most prestigious university. Mm -hmm. When I finished my law degree, mm -hmm. then I thought I should start offering my services to the country. Mm -hmm. Then I joined the um, International Law Office of the Government of Nepal. Mm -hmm. But I did not have a master's degree in international law. Mm -hmm. Without specializing in international law, mm -hmm. I was asked to deal with international legal issues. Mm -hmm. That I was a bit difficult. Then I thought I must specialize mm -hmm. in international law. Okay. I was fortunate to get a fellowship or a scholarship to go to the University of Hull to do my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And then that's how I began, I began my career in international law. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what do you mean of three proven? Okay. Yeah. Is that... yeah. Nepal was until three years ago a kingdom. Oh, right. Okay. So, uh, like in your country, our country had also monarchs, mm -hmm. kings and queens ruling the country. Mm -hmm. Tribhuvan was the uh, king who introduced democratic reforms in the country in 1951. Really? So the main university in Kathmandu mm -hmm. is named after that king. King, I uh, really like Chua in Thailand. Absolutely. That's right. Okay. So, well, as you said before, after practicing law for the government of Nepal, you came to England to study international law. And who was your mentor in Oxford? And and how about his promoting style? My mentor, or we call supervisor, mm -hmm. was right. Professor Christine Gray, mm -hmm. a very fine lady mm -hmm. uh, who has specialized in mm -hmm. international law mm -hmm. and, the, and, and use of force in international okay. law. Mm -hmm. She was my supervisor, and I had a very good supervision from her, high quality supervision. Mm -hmm. There are, I myself have supervised now nearly 26 doctoral students from around the globe. Oh, really? <laughs> and the approach I take mm -hmm. is slightly different from her approach. Mm -hmm. Her approach was to provide a close supervision, mm -hmm. reading whatever I had submitted to her and commenting as thoroughly as possible, mm -hmm. rather than giving me her own ideas how I should mm -hmm. progress. Mm -hmm. So that was her approach, which I liked it, which worked for me. Mm -hmm. It may not work for everybody, but it worked well mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. 
But my approach is a slightly different one. Mm -hmm. I give people lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. Rather than providing detailed comment on what they have produced, mm -hmm. giving them how to proceed, mm -hmm. which are the ideas they could explore, and perhaps more intellectual supervision. Mm -hmm. That's my style. Mm -hmm. Different people have different style. Mm -hmm. You're now just maintaining your supervision. Uh, supervising style to your own students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there any some difference or any some manager, the manager, some um, some promoting style? Yeah. Like well, the the style my supervisor adopted mm -hmm. to supervise me and other people doing mm -hmm. her doctor doctor doing our doctoral research with her was that sometimes perhaps if people are struggling with their ideas, mm -hmm. if they don't know where they should go. Perhaps a bit more proactive intellectual assistance mm -hmm. might be needed. For instance, I had a doctoral student from China. Mm -hmm. For the first three months, he was struggling where he, his research was going. He didn't. He he, he did have a research proposal, mm -hmm. but he wasn't able to focus narrow enough. Enough. Mm -hmm. Then I decided to discuss with him. Had a long session. Mm -hmm. Then I gave him lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then he picked up those ideas. Then after that, I did not need to supervise him much. Mm -hmm. He was a highly capable person. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, he was struggling with his ideas. Mm -hmm. When I gave him some ideas, he was able to progress very well, and he managed to get his PhD. Mm -hmm. So that has been my approach. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, depending on the nature of the candidate, mm -hmm. sometimes the candidate may need right. more ideas yes. rather than reading thoroughly what that person mm -hmm. has submitted to you. The supervising system and style is quite different, just professor by professor. Absolutely. Uh, in my case, uh, Professor uh, Peter Malanchu uh -huh. uh, just uh, gave me some some independent space or room uh -huh. to process my own research projects. So uh -huh. That was quite good for me to uh -huh. uh, design my own research uh, methods or some some um, some scope or some, uh -huh. um, some content. Uh -huh. At that time, it was quite good. Okay. Uh, since 2009, you have been working as UN Special Reporter for Human Rights in Cambodia. Yeah. The, how was the human rights situation in Cambodia when you came there? And how do you expect the future of the country? Thank you. Well, Cambodia is a developing country. Cambodia has gone through a very tragic past. Mm -hmm. um, some sort of political instability mm -hmm. and a, a direct conflict for nearly 30 years. Mm -hmm. That conflict has taken its toll on the society. Mm -hmm. The new political leaders of Cambodia are focused on economic development. Mm -hmm. But when you are embarking on the road to economic development, you cannot compromise or sacrifice human rights standards. Mm -hmm. So the country is struggling to find a balance between economic development and human rights protection. Mm -hmm. That's number one issue. The other one is when Cambodia had a Khmer Rouge government for nearly four years in the late 1970s, that government had the idea of creating a completely new society, dismantling and destroying everything that existed in the country mm -hmm. until that time. Mm -hmm. Cambodia is a very rich country in terms of cultural heritage, mm -hmm. wonderful past. Yeah. But the Khmer Rouge people wanted to destroy the past and start a completely new beginning. Mm -hmm. During that process, lots of records mm -hmm. kept in the government offices were also destroyed. Mm -hmm. For instance, if people own land or buildings, who owned it, the government will have kept some records. So the systematic destruction of any uh, government records and um, systematic killing of intellectuals, lawyers, journalists, academics, teachers, mm -hmm. created a big vacuum in the country. Mm -hmm. So when the Khmer Rouge government was ousted from power, mm -hmm. with the help of the Vietnamese government in 1979, another period of nearly nine, ten years of governance under some sort of socialist influence. Mm -hmm. So that also wasn't terribly helpful for the country to sort out the problems internally. Mm -hmm. So Paris Peace Conference took place in 1991. Mm -hmm. As a result of that one, Cambodia was given a great deal of assistance by the international community and by the United Nations. Then, as a result of that one, elections took place for the Constituent Assembly. 
new constitution, which is a democratic constitution, was adopted in 1993. Mm -hmm. That constitution is still valid. But the challenges for Cambodia today are implementing the human rights standards mm -hmm. embodied in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So the country hasn't still reconciled with the past. It is still in the process of reconciling. Mm -hmm. But there are big challenges. For instance, in your country, South Korea, mm -hmm. or in my country, the judiciary has a long history. Mm -hmm. Judges have become, judges are aware of the need to assert independence. The independence of the judiciary is very crucial in any country to promote and uphold symbol of democracy. So if you don't get any legal remedy, when your rights have been validated, you go to the judiciary. The judiciary has to be independent, impartial and objective in dispensing justice. But in Cambodia, the judiciary began to reconstruct itself mm -hmm. in the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So these are early days for Cambodia. So they need help from the international community, including the United Nations, to strengthen their democracy, to strengthen the independence of the judiciary, to make the rule of law more genuine. Mm -hmm. And one form of help is through the special rapporteur. Mm -hmm. So the United Nations appoints a special rapporteur to monitor the situation of human rights in the country, in the past, monitoring was the main element of the task. Mm -hmm. But these days, monitoring and offering constructive recommendations, suggestions to the government, mm -hmm. how things could be improved. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in my latest report mm -hmm. that I have submitted to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, I have focused on the judiciary. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges the judiciary is facing mm -hmm. and how the challenges could be overcome, mm -hmm. how the government could strengthen the independence and capacity of the judiciary. And I was pleased to receive a letter from the government saying that they are looking at my report with a view to discussing with me and other stakeholders how to improve the judiciary. So Cambodia, in a way, the culture of democracy is not as strong as it should be in a democracy. It has a democratic constitution, it has a parliament, but the culture of democracy is still very young. So the international community could do a lot to help the government to make democracy a part of the society, the culture of the nation. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge I see in the country. In relation to the culture of nation as well as the universal declaration of human rights, um, the human rights is a very fundamental tool of our human society. Mm. But, uh, there are many misunderstandings in mm. Uh, in the international, post international society mm. uh, on the human rights concept because mm. uh, of many uh, differences in cultural history. Yeah. Um, just to, how do you think about the, uh, the human rights concept from a, some, from a viewpoint of Hinduism? Okay. Because you're um, just referring to, have been referring to the Hindu, Hinduistic perspective of human rights and uh, many things because it's a very big part of some the international cultures. Mm. Okay. Yeah. At, at the moment, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think many people uh, still think that the human rights concept is very much a Western construct. Mm -hmm. Right. Western right. construct yeah, developed by Western countries. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my response to that one is that in most civilizations, the core element is about promoting humanity, mm -hmm. betterment of the society. Human rights objectives are very similar to the values of Hinduism, mm -hmm. Buddhism, Buddhism and many other religions, mm -hmm. great civilizations. Mm -hmm. Only the corruption of the literature or the scriptures is a problem in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Those with vested interest have interpreted the religious values mm -hmm. to suit their own political agenda. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, uh, great civilizations, human rights values emerged out of the values of the civilizations. It was not an overnight invention mm -hmm. of a group of people. Mm -hmm. So, from that point of view and looking from Hindu perspective, in Hinduism there are two very interesting things. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was a long time ago that a separation of religion from the state affairs mm -hmm. was agreed. Mm -hmm. Because the main value in Hinduism is that regarding everybody, every man and woman is your brother and sister. Mm -hmm. The whole world World fraternity mm -hmm. is, is called in Sanskrit Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Mm -hmm. 
That means the whole planet, the whole human being mm-hmm. is part of your family. Mm-hmm. So kind once of brotherhood, right? brotherhood, right? Once you have that bra- brotherhood mm-hmm. with everybody, mm-hmm. there is no possibility of discrimination against each other. Mm-hmm. There is no possibility of eliminating er- er- your opponent. Mm-hmm. So the element of peaceful coexistence, mm-hmm. element of a tolerance, mm-hmm. element of brotherhood and fraternity. Mm-hmm element of um, trying to move the society mm-hmm. forward, mm-hmm. advancing human civilization mm-hmm. through law, mm-hmm. through religion. Mm-hmm. So that was the principle in Hinduism. These are very similar to the current element of international, modern international law. Indeed. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's what I was saying. Right. So although in Hinduism, I must say that in practice, mm-hmm. in India, in Nepal, women are discriminated against. Mm-hmm. They don't have equal for instance, rights. property rights, rights and the people, so-called disadvantaged groups or even in old days they were called untouchables, mm-hmm. people belonging to the lowest strata of the society, not given equal access to power, not given equal opportunity to gain education, mm-hmm. not given equal opportunity to compete on equal footing. Mm-hmm. That was the tradition. Mm-hmm. But that was the later version of Hinduism. But the older ancient version of Hinduism does not allow any discrimination. Any oh, right. okay. So on that basis many people have the perception that in Hindu countries mm-hmm. or countries where the popul- sizable population believes in Hinduism, mm-hmm. the society is not equal. Right. Okay. Um, the practice may suggest so, mm-hmm. but the core of the values mm-hmm. uh, accept mm-hmm. the notion of non-discrimination, mm-hmm. equality oh, really? before God. Equality before the law. Even I might have uh, some big misunderstanding that um, Hin- Hindu society has some very big discrimination for Absolutely. following some kind of uh, um, um, some occupation. That's right. Okay, yeah. some kind of classes. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we are moving to some more uh, contemporary questions. Since the uh, September 11 attack, the terrorism has been a core concept of international law. In particular, the United States is trying to restructure the whole international society mm. against terrorism. Mm. Well, this kind of perspective sometimes is very risky because the, uh, it uh, tends to divide uh, the whole situation of international uh, society mm. into uh, good and evil very too simply. Mm. So, uh, I'd like to know about your opinion about the current trend of international law relating to terrorism? Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, what happened in 9-11 made all of us realize mm-hmm. that there are new challenges, mm-hmm. different challenges. Mm-hmm. Perhaps international law, mm-hmm. it existed around that time, mm-hmm. wasn't equipped enough to deal with the new challenges. Mm-hmm. So there was a need to visit or revisit certain principles of international law especially with regard to um, the non-state actors, uh, how they can impact Mm -hmm. the function and operation of international law. Mm -hmm. Non-state actors who have state support carrying out such activities, Mm -hmm. uh, Al-Qaeda is basically a non-state entity, Mm -hmm. but having the support of the state at the time, namely the uh, Taliban government Mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. So from that point of view, it was necessary to revisit Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the Charter of the United Nations was there, is still there, Mm -hmm. prescribing certain fundamental rules of governing international relations. Any departure from the existing principles of international law should be made under the auspices of the United Nations, Mm -hmm. amending the Charter of the United Nations. That's the law Mm -hmm. for the international community. Until and unless you change the law, you must abide by the law. So, the idea that you can intervene in other states Mm -hmm. by undermining the Charter of the United Nations, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, is not a thing to do in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, in the name of fighting the war on terror, Mm -hmm. many excesses have been committed by law enforcement agencies Mm -hmm. in different countries. countries, That has made life difficult for the United Nations and United Nations Human Rights Missionary to promote and protect human rights. Mm -hmm. Because if the countries like the United States 
or France or another country depart from the international human rights values mm -hmm. and then resort to some means, some techniques not sanctioned by international law, then other countries will have an excuse mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the new idea of refashioning or reconstructing the international community mm -hmm. um, under a new value system mm -hmm. has been misused mm -hmm. by some dictatorial governments around the globe mm -hmm. to undermine their own opposition. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily terrorists, but they pose a challenge to autocratic governments. Right. And they have been silenced and the legal measures adopted to combat terrorism has been misused to silence the opposition, mm -hmm. democratic opposition, and then to undermine democratic opposition in the country. Mm -hmm. So, which is not healthy in my opinion. But sometimes it's very ambiguous to identify who the terrorists are yeah. and terrorism because um, sometimes um, in, in when we just came to think about uh, the Taliban uh, regime, mm. okay, they are very deeply affiliated with this nationalism and yeah. religious factors. So, yeah. um, um, don't you think it is too simple to uh, terrorist and the anti-terrorist mm. attack like that? It's too simple concept. Indeed, and it's a difficult one because those who are fighting for their rights in certain countries, mm -hmm. once they gain power, their history will be written as they were freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, before they gain power, they can be regarded as a terrorist. Terrorist, okay. For instance, when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister of the UK, mm -hmm. African National Congress, mm -hmm. led by Nelson Mandela, yeah, Nelson Mandela right, uh, yeah. was condemned right, yeah. as an organization believing in violence. Yeah. But ANC was fighting for democracy, right. but sometimes using some means mm -hmm. necessary to defend and protect their um, cadres. So that was uh, regarded as a resort to violence mm -hmm. by some people. Mm -hmm. But when Nelson Mandela or ANC was elected to power, oh. he became the hero of the world. Okay. <laughs> right. yeah. And that's how it is. So sometimes when you are fighting for your freedom, for your just cause, mm -hmm. uh, you should not resort to use of violence use of no. yeah, yeah. to kill innocent people yeah. and civilians. Because we have, they have power. They have, they have power. power, exactly. So, who is a terrorist, who is not a terrorist, mm -hmm. who is a freedom fighter and who is a person believing in violence? Mm -hmm. That's always a difficult question to answer. Right, right. Yeah. That's the reason it depends on circumstances. It depends on circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's the reason the international community has developed mm -hmm. certain norms, mm -hmm. human rights norms, mm -hmm. the norms under which use of force can be deployed. Mm -hmm. So the the answer should be found within the existing legal framework. Legal framework. Okay. That's what I believe in. Yeah, okay. So there have been instances when states have tried to find answers okay. beyond the current legal framework. Okay. If you are not happy with the current legal framework, mm -hmm. change the legal framework. Mm -hmm. But don't act outside of the legal okay. framework. Then, then, do you think, do you think the preemptive self-defense is in the existing legal framework? Okay. Well, very controversial point indeed, the issue, right? indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that um, when you analyze the provisions in the Charter of the United Nations, mm -hmm. there is no room for preemptive strike. No. Against states. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, use of force is permissible when you have been subjected to an armed attack. Okay, right. That inside. means that it has already taken place. Article 51. Article okay. 51. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the only exception. Mm -hmm. So preemptive strike means that you anticipate certain things. Mm -hmm. You interpret certain information in mm -hmm. certain fashion mm -hmm. and then you go into action. Mm -hmm. That action may be misleading action. Mm -hmm. The information you had in your position may have been wrong information, mm -hmm. but you have already gone into action. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason I'm very careful mm -hmm. in making a distinction mm -hmm. here. Right. So, under international law, mm -hmm. only the Security Council of the United Nations mm -hmm. can authorize the use of force, use of force right here. I to, maintain, right here. to maintain international peace and security. Mm -hmm. right. Collectively, under the auspices of the United Nations, many things are possible. Mm -hmm. But individually, mm -hmm. or a group of states mm -hmm. taking the law into their own hands mm -hmm. and saying that they can carry out a preemptive strike, mm -hmm. 
I don't think it's permitted by international law. No, no, no. Right, okay. Great. So, and um, um, the final questions are very uh, some personal ones too. You now just in your mid fifties. Yeah. And I I believe that you um, you will have many things to do in the future mm. as a leading international lawyer. What do you want to do as an international lawyer in the future? Well, um, we international lawyers mm -hmm. are here to make our own contribution mm -hmm. to the advancement of human civilization. Mm -hmm. We have come a long way from the previous times in which people were subjected to degrading inhuman treatment, mm -hmm. colonial rule, mm -hmm. the right to self-determination de uh, was absent, was absent. Mm -hmm. people were subjected to all sorts of injustices. Mm -hmm. So we have come a long way. Now we have a very good international legal framework. Mm -hmm. But that legal framework is not complete. Mm -hmm. So much work has to be done. Mm -hmm. Every new day brings its own new challenges. Mm -hmm. The society is changing. People's attitudes are changing. Mm -hmm. And different people are behaving in different fashion. Mm -hmm. For instance, 9-11, mm -hmm. nobody anticipated no. that things are like that would occur. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for our generation is to make our own contribution, write our own new chapter mm -hmm. to advance human civilization mm -hmm. so that we all collectively mm -hmm. prosper, live in peace, mm -hmm. live in harmony mm -hmm. and allow everybody to bring out the best that is in them. Mm -hmm. Every human being, we are about six billion of us, mm -hmm. every human being is unique in terms of their capacity, mm -hmm. in terms of their limitations. Oh, yeah. So they should be allowed to exploit and maximize the ability mm -hmm. that they have in them. Mm -hmm. That's the whole essence of the rule of law mm -hmm. and international law. Right. Allow individuals mm -hmm. to achieve what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Some people are, are happy to be monks. Mm -hmm. Some people are happy to be nuns. Mm -hmm. Some people are happy to be millionaires. Some people are happy like me to be an academic. <laughs> right, huh? okay. But that's my choice. Yeah. That individual choice. choice. Okay. Individual choices. Individual choices must be respected. And that person should be allowed to pursue their happiness the way they see their happiness. Mm -hmm. And allow them to maximize the qualities that they have, mm -hmm. the abilities that they have. Mm -hmm. By allowing them to maximize their ability, mm -hmm. they will make their life happy. They will make the life of the family they belong to happy, mm -hmm. they will make the society around them happy mm -hmm. and they will make a contribution to the advancement of international society as well. Right, so, well there are many, some young, uh, gener younger generations who are willing to be uh, international law and have some, some hope to make some contributions on, on the future uh, shaping. So, would you give uh, some um, advice based on your experience to younger generation who are willing to be international lawyer? Indeed. Uh, today, as an international lawyer, you have so much opportunity, mm -hmm. which uh, even 50 years ago or 60 years ago, people did not have. Mm -hmm. Today, if you have specialized in international law, international law is a big area. Mm -hmm. Within that, you have international investment law, international trade law, mm -hmm. WTO GATT law, international human rights law, international environmental law. The current age is the age of specialism. Ah, special. You need to specialize in a narrow area. Mm -hmm. Go as deep as you can. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to say mm -hmm. in your, through your CV or when you are called for interview mm -hmm. that I am one of the experts in this area. Mm -hmm. This knowledge I possess. Mm -hmm. So I am willing to utilize my knowledge mm -hmm. for the advancement of the business. If you are planning to work for a company or for the government, for the betterment of the people. So you ought to be able to say that these are the areas in which I have a in-depth expertise. Mm -hmm. So area, the need to specialize mm -hmm. in certain chosen areas, which interests you most. Mm -hmm. Concentrate on that one. Number two, be an internationalist. Mm -hmm. International law, by definition, requires you to have a much broader outlook, mm -hmm. a global outlook to problems. Glo we, the world is shrinking. Mm -hmm. It's becoming interdependent. It is Many problems the people in South Korea may be encountering mm -hmm. are not very different from the problems people are encountering in other parts of the world. Yeah. 
So these are global challenges. Mm -hmm. Global challenges require global mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. One of the ways of responding to global mm -hmm. challenges is through the rule of law. Mm -hmm. That is international law. Mm -hmm. So if you have a global outlook, you will be able to go further, make your career more successful. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I would say mm -hmm. that uh, the more you are exposed to international environment, mm -hmm. the more you can understand each other better. Okay. The better you can serve, mm -hmm. the better your career will be. Mm -hmm. Many international lawyers who have traveled widely, who have been exposed to different cultures, different traditions, different people, can understand each other better. Mm -hmm. Much of the problems that we are facing today mm -hmm. is due to lack of understanding each other well. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand each other it's better human as human beings. As human beings. Human beings. Yeah. As international lawyers, for instance, my students in the UK, mm -hmm study very widely what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. So I encourage them to even go deeper mm -hmm. and understand the world mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. With that understanding, the prejudices disappear. Mm -hmm. Much of the problems of discrimination against people, racism, xenophobia, these things are caused by ignorance. Mm -hmm. right. Once you are more enlightened, mm -hmm. once you understand the culture and traditions of different mm -hmm. societies, mm -hmm. what do they have to offer? Mm -hmm. Every culture has something wonderful to offer. Yeah. If you don't understand what it has to offer, you only see the darker side of things mm -hmm. that you are prejudiced against them. Mm -hmm. Your prejudice works against you and against them. Mm -hmm. Creates tension in the society. So learn to become tolerant, believe in the rule of law, mm -hmm. and remember one thing, your first and foremost loyalty should be to the rule of law. You as a lawyer. Yeah. That you should never forget. That is a great advice to uh, just post to the younger generation and to me. Thank right? you. You're younger than you are. Thank you. Okay. Well, so today's uh, discussion uh, will be very helpful for the old international lawyers and both in acad academics and in practical world uh, to understand a uh, different society as well as the uh, newly uh, just coming uh, international legal regime and norms. So, uh, once again, I'd like to give uh, my just a deepest appreciation to you coming here and to uh, just accept our proposal to have uh, this wonderful interview. I'd like to, uh, I hope you have some uh, good time in um, Korea for the following a few days. Well, thank you very much once yeah. again. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to interact with oh, this pleasure. afternoon yeah, I'll honor and you. I was very happy to yeah. answer some of your questions. Yeah. I hope this will be of interest to your readers and to your viewers. Uh -huh. And Korea has done so well, it's one of the Asian countries mm -hmm. and economically it has done well. Mm -hmm. It has now strengthened its democracy, rule of law, mm -hmm. it's more mature democracy than it was 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the struggle right. the people in this country have right. gone through mm -hmm. to make this society more democratic. I'm uh, reading about it, I'm more fascinated mm -hmm. by the history and culture of this country. 